Okay, um, we still have a few people joining, but I'll, I'll kick off. Um, and, and we want to thank very much the Open Data Engagement Fund out of the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and the OPW for their support of this uh, event. Um, just to give some context as to why we're running this event, one of the, um, you know, hopefully you're aware of Natural Capital Ireland as a non-profit that's promoting uh, the natural capital agenda in Ireland. Um, and one of the flagship projects that we're involved with is the In Case project, which is applying natural capital accounting principles um, and techniques in four different areas in Ireland. We'll actually hear more about it later. Uh, but what we found through that work is, um, you know, it's actually a very data hungry exercise is uh, natural capital accounting and we engage with a lot of data holders and um, data platforms and um, through that we were able to identify challenges, opportunities, um, and we, we thought it'd be a great opportunity to, um, to bring everybody together and, uh, and see if we can resolve some of those. And that's uh, what, we, what we're hoping to do today to produce some recommendations, as I say, for um, the Minister of State for Open Data. Um, so we, we are recording this session and we'll make the presentations available on Natural Capital Ireland's YouTube channel. The, uh, any discussion parts of the sessions won't be made available, but we'll take notes on themes, just unattributed uh, notes, no kind of attributed comments, but um, these themes that are uh, that will be reflected in our uh, recommendations report. And at any time, if you have uh, a comment or a question, you can add it in the chat box. Um, so I'll just run through the agenda for today. Um, we have three brilliant speakers to, to begin with, just to give, uh, these are data kind of users, um, collectors as well, and, um, and experiences, I think, with, with nature-related data is, is the theme of, of these first three presentations. So we have uh, Dr. Liam Lysett from the uh, National Biodiversity Data Centre. We have Tony Brew from the Office of Public Works and Paddy Morris from the EPA catch, Catchments Unit. Then we'll have some time for, for Q&A. And then some quick fire talks. And I don't know if anyone's uh, experienced these kind of quick fire talks before, but I, you know, I think it's a great format to hear a lot and um, hear a lot of different perspectives quickly. So uh, five minute talks from Irish research projects that are applying nature related data, uh, using it and um, applying it in, in really innovative ways. So um, we'll hear from five of them and we might have some time for, for Q&A there. And then finally, we're going to uh, have just some remarks from our rapporteur. What are the key themes we heard today? Um, and that will be from uh, Kieran Sullivan uh, from Waterford Institute of Technology. And then we'll close at 15.40, a little bit later than, than advertised, but we just want to make sure we have enough time for that discussion and engagement from yourselves. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass on to Liam, um, who can share his own screen. And, um, and yeah, over to Liam. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much. Is that um, is that shared? Yep, that's perfect. Okay, listen, thank you very much for the invitation to, to give a brief overview of the work that the data center does and some of the data infrastructure issues. Um, when we were established way back in 2007, we kind of did a sectoral assessment of what we found in order to identify where we might be positioned or what the job of the data center was to be done. And, and quite simply, we found that there was an inability to answer basic questions about what biodiversity we have, how it's distributed and how it's changing. Um, and, and simply, quite simply, the needs for availability of data were not met. And there was reasons for that. Um, there was no centralized system for management of, of data. Uh, data were dispersed across uh, various, um, sorry, I'm just gonna change. Uh, various individuals, projects and organizations, and there was no common standards or very few common standards, tools or way to share data. And I suppose the context then in which the data center was established was that there was many organizations involved with no data sharing or coordination agreements. Uh, there was no dedicated voice for promoting biodiversity data as a discipline in its own right. And there was no clear infrastructure for coordination and collation of, of biodiversity data. So this really, I suppose, was the rationale why the Heritage Council and National Parks and Wildlife uh, agreed to fund the establishment of the National Biodiversity Data Centre. 
So we developed a strategic plan to try to identify how we could best position ourselves and make the biggest impact in terms of this, this sector and how to provide support for it. And in our strategic plan, we identified seven key strategic objectives, just mobilizing data, tracking change, informing decision-making, developing strategic partnerships, international collaboration, communicating the value of biodiversity and strengthening the recording base. So that was really the rationale or the, the, the framework we operated under. And just on the left-hand side, I want to show you a schematic diagram that we built an infrastructure to allow us uh, to, to deliver on these strategic ob objectives. And you don't have to look at the detail, but we developed nine different kind of modules or applications to help us to capture data, present data, manage data, and make it more information, more freely available for people. And I just want to show the inner the inner circle, I suppose, of the, the data and information cycle. So there was applications involved with management of data, there was applications developed for publishing data, applications for coordination, and then applications to report out. And of course, that should close the data cycle because as a result of what's found on the reporting, it should identify priorities for new collection and begin the data cycle again. So this is the kind of large scale infrastructure that did data set developed. It's perhaps biodiversity maps, which is the kind of outward looking uh, uh, data and, and mapping portal that we've developed that people would be most familiar with. And as I say, this is the kind of web tool publicly facing um, uh, application that we have where people can see what data is available and, and use it. And I just want to kind of work you through or bring you through the data flow in terms of how this works on a schematic basis. On the left hand side, we have people in the field, citizen scientists or researchers who are capturing, capturing data in the field. They can capture the data in real time through a mobile phone app, or they can submit data to us separately through an online resource when they come back. And those data are stored in an unvalidated database. And that's the citizen science portal. You can see in real time data that's captured and people can manage their own information on that unvalidated database. So it's the citizen science portal. And running parallel with that then, any uh, data sets, whether they're national ones or high quality ones or thematic ones, they can either be polygon, habitat layers or species occurrence data. These can all be brought into our system, but they all undergo this data validation process. So there's a kind of a firewall operation between the unvalidated data and on the right hand side, the validated database. So once all of these data and data sets have passed through validation, they're loaded into the validated national biodiversity database. And this is basically then from which the data are fed out to biodiversity maps, as which I mentioned is a kind of a mapping and data tool for people to access data. And data can go from this back out to citizen scientists or researchers so they can see how their data are contributing to the, to the larger whole. Validated data are then fed through into the Global Biodiversity Information Facility and that is a huge resource of data that's use, use, useful for researchers. And as Yvonne has mentioned, it's all got the, the proper protocols in terms of, of accessibility and DOIs to make sure that it's, you can do a fitness for use for, for use for research purposes. The data are then fed to specific uses. They automatically feed to data. Well, I should say actually the, the um, we publish data through two licenses systems. One is restricted. And the second is, is um, CCBY, so that's open with accreditation. So any of the open data is fed through to the international global uh, facility and fed through to data.gov.ie. The data is available to National Parks and Wildlife for assessment, red list assessments. And then the data is also available for conservation management. This is in the broader, broader terms. It can be for just finding out what's, what's in your locality or it could feed into, you know, informing um, you know, protected area management, for example. And the data then can be made available through planning into the appropriate assessment or an EIS. So this is the, this is the out uh, as such. But there's also the ability to feed data dynamically through APIs into third party uh, GIS systems. Uh, and we're working with some state bodies to see if we can provide that. So the intention is that the data curation work would be retained within the data center, but there'd be a dynamic feedback out to partners so that you wouldn't be duplicating effort. And I suppose the question is, have we been successful or not? It's probably others to judge in terms of our success. What I can say is that 
The database has grown in terms of species occurrence data. There are now just short of four and a half million occurrence data in the data set that can be accessed by anyone. Um, only just over a million of these are open data, uh, which is an issue and I'll come back to. We have data on almost 17,000 species. So there's at least some occurrence data for half of the species that we know that are uh, documented for Ireland. And there's 160 different data sets uh, mapped through this. I just want to say that we do, we're not really trying to, do, to increase the number of data sets per se in the data set in the, in the database. What we're trying to do is collate data together. So for example, we did a, an atlas of mammals in Ireland and we, we tried to get all the, 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 the subsets together into a larger data set so that they'd be each kind of smaller subset of data would be retained as a survey within an overall Atlas of Mammals of Ireland data set. So we're not really trying to grow the number of data sets, we're trying to collate uh, existing data. And just to say that there's a range of users who have availed of the sh uh, shared service. We have state bodies, we have NGOs, research community, and British-based organizations. And I suppose I should just say about the British-based organizations, it's good that we've been able to bring data that's been managed about Ireland in Britain back into our portal so that the data is information, the information is available for decision making. And it means that we're kind of repatriating some, some Irish data, which is an important service. You don't need to see the detail, but we have a range of users who have availed of the sh shared service. So I suppose to, to kind of uh, wind up really, the vision that we have is that we wanted to create a national platform for digital biodiversity data management. Um, we wanted to provide dedicated data curation services and, and Yvonne again mentioned this, that this is a task in its own right and we need to have dedicated resources for that. Uh, there's a portal for publishing and dissemination of biodiversity data through biodiversity maps. Uh, we see it as a resource for decision making and research. Uh, it operates to common standards and licenses and it promotes the concept of open and reuse of data. And the important thing is the state has invested in this and we're predicated the, the system on the principle of it being offered as a shared service to partners to deliver added value. It's a free service for most partners and we want to coordinate and provide added value, as I say, to the work we're doing. And then by way of challenge, I suppose. Um, just one minute there, Liam. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just uh, wrapping up. We need to promote more the the concepts uh, of the benefits of open data. It's not a given that people understand the, the, the principles and the benefits of sharing data and open data. We need to do more of that within the community. Um, the system was re very well, was well funded initially, but there needs to be an understanding that there's needs for continued investment to ensure that we can keep up with modern technologies and we can add, add functionality to ensure we're fit for purpose. Uh, look, there needs to be consensus around what is a national platform for biodiversity. It surprises me that in some quarters we've seen as competition rather than as a national service for everyone to share. And I suppose on a personal level, I would say that we haven't, I don't think the data center and this infrastructure has actually reached the potential it has as being offered as a national infrastructure. And, and that's something we need to work on. And I accept that we haven't reached our potential. But then finally, I just want to make the point that with, with the limitations that exist, the data center and its informatics infrastructure is still, I think, the best starting point for meeting the needs for biodiversity conservation and, and biodiversity data to feed into policy. Thank you. Super. Thanks so much, Liam. Um, yeah, I think that gives a really good overview of uh, what it's like being kind of a data manager and collector and uh, the, the issues and challenges there. Um, Fantastic. So I think we'll pass on to Tony Brew now from uh, the OPW. Tony, you're there. I see you. Um, so, yeah, we can see your screen if you just want to put it on full screen mode. Over to you. Is that full screen? Uh, not just yet. You just need to click uh, F5. Yeah, click those areas. OK. Oh, yeah, All right. OK, that's the most stressful part over anyway, getting it on the screen. Um, exactly. Uh, I'm not a GIS specialist, but I'm a manager that's using GIS data to create tools and management systems to manage people on the ground to maintain uh, large amounts of infrastructure. So looking at it from a different viewpoint than some of the, some of the rest of the talkers today. So, um, minimize that. So the aims of our data specification are to produce um, clean data, obviously, 
So we'd been, we had been going around in circles for years where different consultants would come in with data in different formats with different fields. So we had to create this specification to rationalize what we were doing. So in flooding and drainage, there's a huge amount of ecological assessments done. Lots of planning requirements, NISs, and all that needs to be coming in in a usable format. So we use that data then to create procedures and we use them, those procedures to limit impacts, impacts. And then we create viewers to communicate with ground staff. Here you can see a quick overview of what the layers, uh, the, the viewers look like. But um, these, these are the main project risks for developing a spec. So the big ones in delivering any project are buying, communication, consultation and training. So you have to um, engage with people and get their um, in, uh, opinions on board. You know, you may need to make them feel they're part of the process. So we're getting this information from the ground, from ecology. We're getting clean data and we're communicating it back to the guys on the ground. Uh, you know, the, the people working in machines, the people that are, are maintaining all these different buildings and rivers and infrastructure. So you have to involve them in the process. And uh, one of the most involved parts of any of this, of any of this project delivery is that consultation. So through the consultation, we would have developed uh, a, a large questionnaire and it would involve the opinions of lots of different parts of the OPW. The OPW is a very disparate organization with lots of uh, different sections. So we developed this questionnaire to engage with people and get their opinions. So this is an example of some of the kind of data we're trying to, um, to, trying to gather. So we're, uh, this is an example here, a bat roost found in the magazine fort in, in Phoenix Park. So OPW have existing asset nomenclature. It's got property codes, it's got building codes, it's different asset codes. So you're generating the data using those fields. And um, you know, you're making it uh, uh, available to using all these different systems. So in the OPW, there's different systems and you have to consider these systems and different systems have to be able to talk to each other. So you have to design the, the spec for your own needs really. So here are some of the layers that we are we have developed. Um, we have layers on invasive species plants. These are the plants listed in SS, SI 477 in third schedule. We have invasive species animals. But we have habitat um, mapping area and line. We have ecological enhancements. So that's where you know someone's coming in and put an artificial nest site. So we get to record that on our on our in our data sets, and then. We have the key environmental data. This is one of the more important layers. It's where we, you, uh, you have, have observed um, a protected species or a legally protected species. And this would really um, change how uh, you would progress work on site. You'd have this information and uh, it limits then how you would carry out that work. Then we have information on supplementary data. That's more sightings and observations. That wouldn't really, uh, that's ancillary information. It wouldn't impact how you would deliver works and then we have layers on project area, image locations, and tree, tree data. So as I said, there's 1 billion worth of capital investment going on in flood relief at the moment. So there's a huge amount of data being delivered through that. You've got, you, you can imagine the planning process for delivering a flood relief scheme, the NISs, you've the EIARs, you've got uh, bird surveys, you've got uh, ecological assessments and all this information you know, if we didn't start off on the right foot, it would come in in a mess and we'd never be able to use it. So the spec is really underpinning how this information comes in. So it's generating a lot of information. And then and you've important uh, members of staff within the OPW to collate and manage data. So, you know, you need these key people in positions and that takes resources and uh, that needs to be considered when you're, when you're design, designing your spec, how you would gather that information. The next steps for the OPW are that we are delivering a biodiversity action strategy. And some of those um, actions are going to be data management based. And um, we're going to use um, data management then to report and manage some of the actions from that biodiversity. And it's, it's now an opportunity, there's an opportunity now to broaden this spec to other sections of the OPW from just flooding and drainage. So this is, a, this is just a flow diagram showing the data flow for, within OPW. So I said, there's lots of different sources of information coming from consultants, ecologists, OPW staff, through, through five-year NISs, that's a framework of NISs we do. We have bat surveys, habitat mapping, 
And that creates all these uh, interesting and useful data sets that we can use on the in the field then. So our habitat mapping and species locations and invasive species. So all the information is coming into the OPW and we manage these layers then through these specifications to ensure the data is clean and that we can reuse this information. So this specification then goes through managers in the field in a certain location and this then goes gets put on viewers. We have data management section in OPW and they manage these viewers. And then this information then is um, created in a user-friendly format and we, get, we can get this information back out in the field. So the, uh, the guys on the ground, uh, the people on the ground can know where all the highs and uh, holts and sets and trees and plants are, and they can protect habitats and high biodiversity areas. And, you know, there's potential for this to become a, a repository for information. And the aim of it is to limit impacts and, you know, we can avoid invasive species when we know they're on site and, you know, we can measure and monitor enhancements when we get them in. So the whole idea of this is we're going to generate user-friendly data. So we have these icons that we uh, we delivered through our, our viewers. So we've got these nice pictures of a, a badger head. So when a, a foreman or a guy on the ground, he sees this, he knows it triggers a, a thought process with him. He knows there's a procedure he has to comply with and he has to uh, change how he carries out that work process. So, you know, you're trying to deliver this user-friendly um, information to uh, limit impacts. So, you know, a, an interesting thing to consider is, uh, you know, for ecological enhancements, using polygons for wildflower meadows and uh, biodiversity managed lawns and constructive wetlands and things like that. So at the moment, our, our, uh, our layers are just uh, point data for, um, for uh, ecological enhancements, but I think we'll broaden that out to include polygons as well. So this is a, an overview of what the viewer looks like. So there's an opportunity for uh, to print ready uh, function in it. And there's uh, layers for uh, engineers and foremen. So you can here see the layer tree down the left hand side. Um, you know, this is some of the information that a foreman might present to be presented with. So he knows he has to go and maintain a stretch of river. He, um, and you can see there's invasive species and there's an auto hold in sight. So he refers to the procedures and he changed his work processes. So uh, another interesting thing there, you can see uh, the red part, of, that's the River Meg in um, County Limerick. So the River Meg, uh, that red is Annex 1 um, habitat. So that's part of uh, qualif uh, the qualifying interest for the Lower Shannon SAC. So, you know, uh, people need to be careful in how they will carry out work in around that uh, qualifying interest um, habitat. So it's important uh, we make the data relevant, objective, uh, and accurate. So we have to ensure the data works. So we have to tailor the information around the existing asset codes within the OPW, the, the building codes, the property codes I mentioned earlier, earlier the, 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 the river scheme um, descriptors. And you have, to, uh, you have to allow this information to be queried and uh, uh, get that information back out. So, Questions you have to ask yourself if you're, if you're developing a spec for your own organization is, uh, is it going to be just for asset management or is there going to be individual observations? Is, is that bat roost going to be uh, just in, in, in a, a building that you have to maintain or would it, or would it be in a wall or somewhere there where an individual observation has to be made? Will the information be collected by consultants or staff? Uh, there's mechanisms then for, you know, there's field collection software you can use uh, and how, how would you get that information from the field back into your data set? The OPW at the moment in drainage and flood relief, there's people in key roles that um, talk to the foreman, um, you know, maybe he's put in a, an artificial uh, nest site, he creates a shape file and that gets sent up to data management and they, uh, they look after the viewers, they, 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 look, they, they look after the data sets. So that's how it's happening at the OPW at the moment. Just one minute left there, Tony. Okay, um, so this is the major tool for um, delivering um, uh, limiting impacts in the OPWs through the environmental guidance um, documents. So here are some of the procedures that are underpinned by uh, GIS information and, you know, that's the backbone how, how we deliver our work. So this is an example of guys in the field, what they might have to, whether if they encounter an observation of an opportunity 
to make this observation on this weekly record time card. And this information then can come back into the viewers and they can see the observations they made. It just reminds people what they should be looking out for. So this is a, a driver he come across this badger set. So he makes the observation on time card. We get an ecologist out on site to confirm what it is. And then that goes on to our layers. So here's an example. Um, a foreman, he, he looks at the data set. He can see there's not many ecological and enhancements uh, in his area. So he, um, so he gets two guys to go out there. Nice, easy when two guys with a shovel, they get to put this um, artificial nest site. So all these layers are informing people of the opportunities that are out there for them. So this guy then, how does he get back to the mapping? You know, there's a guy uh, in this situation, I would create a shapefile and get this back into the layer. So, you know, just trying to engineer a, a solution to the, some solutions to the biodiversity crisis we all, we all are encountering. So, you know, this is an example of uh, ecological enhancement. So they, you can see this goes in the layer and then people can, can advertise the work that they're doing within their sections. So uh, what are the lessons we've learned? Okay. Uh, you know, we're creating this as a tool, so really has to be uh, developed with our own assets and systems in place. So you can't really lose sight of um, what you're trying to do with your own organization. I know it's great to share this information, but you really have to, uh, you really have to meet the requirements of the old, your own organization if you're trying to create a useful tool. Uh, one uh, a useful field we have is a record status on habitat mapping. Habitat mapping can quite, stay quite stable over time but you know if it does change we can put in this modified record or a new record and that's a handy management tool we develop um hatching for habitat mapping based on the um the uh, heritage council coloring um it's interesting it came up in one of the breakout um conversations earlier about you know people opening gis files and they don't know what's in it but this is a system we've used we use key attribute data in the field description so you know what river scheme it is, what type of data is, and that informs you before you even open the data set. Uh, you, you know, there's opportunities for unique identifiers that describe the sequence. And, um, you know, I think it's very important that when you're devi devising these specs that you really limit how people can make observations. You know, it's, it's amazing how many ways a thing like an otter hold can be described. You know, it could be holds, otters, Auto holds, you could have a, a variation of different descriptors. So you have to really limit how people describe things. And you have to really consider how people collect things. And polygons and points, some data collection software doesn't work well with polygons. So you need to consider that. At the moment, the OPW is, um, is using maps in the field. So we're printing out maps. So we really need to get to a scenario where drivers have tablets and they have access to these, um, these, uh, these layers in the field. And all these shape files and the specifications are on the OPW website. So the positives are that um, flooding side of the house is generating a lot of environmental information and that's been delivered to this GIS spec. So it's coming in in clean, da clean, clean data. And there's opportunities to broaden this now to the rest of the OPW. So we're looking for good environmental outcomes and to report and limit impacts um, where we can. So this is all all data-driven decision-making that a lot of us are trying to do at the moment. So that's it for me now. Super, thanks a million, Tony. Um, great insights from your work in the OPW. Um, and now we're gonna pass on to uh, Paddy Morris of the EPA catchments unit. Um, and yeah, perfect. We've got your full screen slides up there, Paddy. Thanks. Sorry, can you all see the screen there? Yep, perfect. Apologies about that. So I'm just going to give you a quick whirlwind to tour to kind of water quality uh, information in Ireland and what we're doing with it. Um, I'll start with this. Um, apologies. So this is one of our Q5 sites. This is one of the highest quality sites left in the country. In 2020, we had about 20 of these sites left. Um, and I think it's important always to take us back to what we're actually here to do, which is to protect something that's very, very precious and a natural treasure like that. Just to let you know, this is actually a long term data set. It's actually the 50th anniversary of the data set this year. So it does give us long term trends. 
Um, it basically shows us that there's only 20 of these highest quality sites left now. And action has been taken on that starting this year. We have a water supply project, which is 9 million. And also a blue dots program uh, has been undertaken by the local authorities, law pro and other stakeholders. But you can see there's an ongoing decline. So action is clearly necessary. So to kind of now to skip forward to um, the water framework directive and what the EPA catchments unit does. Um, also all results from 1971 to 2020 and every single one of them is available on the EPA water map. We, uh, we publish as much data as we can. So just to take you through the Water Framework Directive, it runs in six year cycles. So it went from 2009 to 15, and then 15 to 21, and then 22 to 27. Um, to take you to roughly the end of the first cycle, um, essentially what happened at the end of that was we'd spent about between 2000 and 2014, um, billions had been spent, 8 billion, on addressing point sources of pollution. But there'd been no overall improvement in water quality. So it was clear at the end of the first cycle, or as it came to an end, that we needed a new approach. So the EPA catchments units was set up in 2014, alongside a new governance model that basically assigned policy and plans, to the Department of Housing, technical oversight and coordination to the EPA, and then WFD implementing bodies like local authorities and the local authority waters program were, uh, were, were given a very specific role under new governance legislation. So when we were set up in 2014, um, we, in the, we adapted from the US EPA an approach called integrated catchment management. Um, so this is basically a, you know, it's an iterative approach. It's not, an, you know, there's never an end goal here. You work your way through the process and essentially you get to the end and you start again, just like the Water Framework Directive. I'm just going to take you through three of the steps here. So the first one was, um, was building partnerships. So we, we actually, we thought this was exceptionally important. So that's both internally and externally, you know, public service, outside the public service and between different agencies. Our unit was a cross-disciplinary team. So we've had a catchment scientist, hydrogeologist, hydromorphologist, ecologist, chemist, planner, GIS specialist, communications person, and a business analyst. And the most important thing we did when we started out, or one of the most important things is as well as been focused on the data and data sets, we talked to everyone. So we set up workshops with all of the local authorities and WFD implementing bodies. Um, so we would go and learn and talk from the local ex experts as well as using data sets. And one thing that I've learned going along is that listening and learning the languages that others speak, that, that the technical aspects of other people's language is absolutely important. We developed a vision. This is our own EPA catchments vision. Other people can have different visions of what they want to do with the water, but we decided it was a good one just to kind of focus our minds at the start. So it was working together for healthy, resilient, productive and valued water resources, supporting vibrant communities. So next we moved on working with, with our partnerships and with our vision to characterizing our catchments. Now in Ireland, we have about 5,000 water bodies, 500 sub catchments, 46 catchments, and now one national river basin district. These are nested scales. So the water bodies are within sub catchments, the sub catchments are within catchments. And at each of these different scales, we do different things. So at water body scale, we monitor and report status. We then assess risk, prioritize measures, and plan and report to the EU. So just for every water body, we work through the same process. Um, the first steps are automated. And then for water bodies that we judge to be at risk, we do further assessment. To take you to risk, risk is very specific. It is the risk of not meeting the water framework directive objective for that body unless appropriate measures are taken. Uh, it starts with an automated calculation for every water body in the country, and then we do further assessments on the ones that are necessary. We're looking at the status, the trend is up or down, the distance to the threshold, and that gives us risk. We used for this about 140 data sets, and we also used outputs from tools that we had developed in cell, ourselves in the unit. So that's source load apportionment models and pollution impact potential maps. And that allowed us to identify significant pressures, essentially what's causing the problems and where for every water body. So just to take you quickly through some of the tools, we did national source apportionment, apportionments, looking at phosphorus and nitrogen, where are the problems, um, what's causing them. So you can see there that that's, that's the national data, that's 2012 Daphne data and 2014 urban wastewater data from the EPA. Again, building the partnerships and using others' data was absolutely vital to building up this level of knowledge and understanding. We can then break that down regionally. So you can see clearly that urban sources of phosphorus are, are quite important, but they're largely in coastal areas. And elsewhere, it's very clear from the source apportionment modeling that it's essentially diffuse agricultural sources are what's causing the problem in the landscape. 
um, in, in rural areas. Um, now that's not surprising because the agriculture is about 63% of the land cover in Ireland. So it's not surprising that agriculture is, called, is a source of the problems. And you can see there's other sources as well. So we have that broken down by sector. We can also break it down by catchment or by subcatchment. Um, so that gave us um, basically an understanding of what's causing the problems. We are now able to break it down into of the body, water bodies that are at risk, where action needs to be taken, what's causing the problems. You can see agriculture is a significant proportion of the problems, and then hydromorphology. And then after that, it kind of runs down to forestry, urban wastewater, urban runoff. So now we know what the problems are, we know what's causing them, and we know something needs to be done about them to get the, the, the to, to reach our water framework directive objectives. So what do we do? Well, we used our information and the insights from the information to target areas for action where we thought we would get a benefit or where action needed to be taken to prevent a decline. Um, as well as this, as well as quantifying the scientific reasons and the assessments that needed to be done, we quantified the person years required for further characterization. So we were, were, did our tier one, which is our automated risk assessment. We then worked through our 140 data sets and talked to all of the stakeholders in the area to, to gather the local knowledge. And then we quantified if further work was done, you know, a rough estimate of the person years required for it. And basically this, this was all included in the plan for 2018 to 2021. The new local authority waters program was set up. They work with other water framework directive implementing bodies in these areas. And they also work with Chagas advisors on a voluntary and confidential basis with farmers in these specific areas. So that's 190 priority areas for action. And just to give you the total, the total staff hired um, to, to work on this is approximately 89 staff. So you have catchment scientists, 30 farm advisors, and 12 community water officers who do full-time public engagement, which is great because it allows us to get the message out there and to talk to communities about what's important to them and what they know about their local area and to integrate that into the scientific process as well. So just in an area for action, we very quickly, we walk, we look at what's causing the problems, our modeling, we then look at stakeholder knowledge, but then it's about community engagement, stream walks and co-designing practice change within that area. So again, it's all about working within and for the local community and talking and listening to them is, is a vital part of this. Um, it's been a little bit harder in 2020, but the, um, the local authority waters program have done great work there and moving to virtual events. And then when we want to actually go out and, you know, do something, well, where do we start? And all of our work in the unit is about targeting actions or informing policy. So one of the key things is looking at phosphorus and phosphorus loss specifically from diffuse agriculture. Um, so what we've done is we started with risk rankings um, and essentially we built up the, a model structure. So we look at bedrock, we look at subsoils, we look at soils. Uh, that gives us the hydrogeological susceptibility of an area. We then look at DAFM lipis data. Um, again, it's absolutely vital to, to share this data and to work with others, which gives us the agricultural loadings. Uh, we then built uh, basically a 3D map of the country to look at delivery paths, so how the phosphorus flows over land and overland flow delivery paths. Um, and then we broke that down, and you can see we now have delivery pathways. So what that allows us to know is if you have overland flow, so the water is flowing over land on the catchment, where will it end up? And this is actually critical because basically we can then run that against our existing data set of all the water bodies in the country. And we can see where the phosphorus overland flow intercepts with the, the river water body, which gives you a delivery point. Um, the insights from this are really important. So one minute it, left there, Paddy. Thanks. thanks very much. So basically, we've been able to pinpoint 2,400 kilometers of riverbank that need pathway interception measures for phosphorus. Um, that's about 2% of the overall total. So it allows us to target the action really, really clearly. So I suppose the overall message here is that we're working through many different data sets. We're working with as many people as possible, including local communities, and we're using it to target action and inform policy. Um, and just to give you an idea, the target of actions, critical focus should be multiple benefits for biodiversity and, and climate. Um, just to give you the overall summary of where we are, 47% of our rivers and 62% of our estuaries are unsatisfactory. So we do need to act now. Um, and just to, to sum up, we need to take action, but not all catchments need the same actions. We have the science and tools to target the right measure in the right place. We need to join up the policy, the messaging, the actions and the supports, you know, for all public bodies need to be singing from the same hymn sheet if they're going out and talking to people in the local communities. And we need to have target measures for multiple benefits. 
you want to know more, we have catchments.ie. We've made a point of sharing as much of the evidence base as, and some stories. So on that, you can get weekly water news updates. We publish a newsletter two or three times a year. We have dashboards. We have 46 catchment assessments, which will be updated this summer, 583 sub-catchment assessments, 4,000 water body pages, and you can also download chemistry data there. So we think it's also important as a principle to make as much of our data open as possible to underpin basically the, you know, it's for the, to give the evidence base to underpin others' actions and the form, formulation of plans. Um, that's it. Thanks very much. Super. Thanks so much, Paddy. Um, really interesting example of, um, of applying the data to get even ever more targeted actions, um, but also these actions can have uh, co-benefits, multiple benefits. So I think that's really, um, really, really interesting. I'll hand over to Isolt now just to, to monitor the, um, the question and answer session. If you have any questions and answers, uh, please, or questions rather, please add them in the chat. Thanks so much. Um, so our first question is for Liam. Um, so does the NBDC collate any information on the types of users or different sectors accessing the NBDC data um, or the reasons why that data is accessed? And just a suggestion that it could be useful to know the numbers and trends and requests from non-environment or biodiversity groups in terms of who needs what and why. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Connor, for that question. That's interesting. We did have a system of registration where we asked people to register what type of sector they're from, but actually we felt that that, that kind of undermined us more with the principle of open data, so we removed it. So we, we actually have a, a free system that anyone can, can, can access. So the only way that we can, we can make inferences, and there are inferences about who uses them, is actually looking at the user statistics on the on the mapping portal because any third party can can access the data. So we know, for example, that the use of biodiversity maps as a tool is used primarily during the week, whereas the citizen science per, um, portal is used primarily during the weekend. So there's a difference between professional and and citizen scientists. And we also have stats in terms of the um, the queries by area. So we know that what percentage are for designated sites for SACs, for example. So we have some insights, but we don't, um, we, we don't really have very detailed information on that. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so our second question is for Tony. Um, can members of the public access OPW biodiversity and ecological reports or mapping for their own geographical locations? At the moment, no, not really. There's a, a do not release clause on our data release matrix, but we have in individual situations made it available. There's concerns about uh, the sensitivities around some observations, some, some otter holds and things like that. Uh, it does made too freely available. Um, our environmental reporting though, our, uh, our NISs, they're, they're available on the, the website. So you know, our, our environmental reporting, but um, data sets at the moment, they're not freely available, no. But uh, I think that there needs to be consideration of uh, maybe future policy on that. I know there's opportunities to maybe gray the locations of where you could have a, a, a wide scale kind of um, uh, understanding of where, where an individual observation is, so you don't know exactly where it is. So I think there could be opportunities for it in the future, all right. Thanks so much. Okay, so for our final question is for Patty then. Um, was it difficult to develop partnerships and was there good uptake? Um, I wouldn't say it was too difficult, but it took a lot of time. So it does take time. And I suppose the most important thing we found was we weren't going out and essentially dictating to people, our data says X, why haven't you done Y? We were saying, look, we've done a desktop assessment. You guys would have the local knowledge. So the most important thing really to building the partnerships was listening. Um, and kind of understanding where people were coming from. And if you think about when we started in 2014, a lot of people were coming out of the recession when resources were tight. So part of that process was asking them what would they need from a resource perspective if we were telling them there's a problem, how would they address it? So it was always a two-way way of working with people. And if you go out with two ears and one mouth, normally building partnerships can go quite well, essentially. But it was, it, it, I wouldn't underestimate the time it took. Um, overall, the first round of characterization, we spent about 50 person years in characterization. And some of these workshops went for up to five days at a time with up to five staff at them. Um, multiply those by five regions, and all of a sudden you're at a huge, huge input of time. But it has paid off. And one thing that where it's been absolutely vital is spending the time then to build those relationships when the pandemic hit, which none of us could foresee. 
we'd established that kind of social capital and those relationships and we've been able to keep working during the pandemic so the short answer is it it, it takes time um i wouldn't um but it is worth it um, particularly for long-term goals like managing environmental problems that's great thanks so much i think that's all we have time for Great. Yeah, thanks, Mayan. Um, so I see some questions coming in in the chat. Um, feel free to answer them in the chat, and we might have uh, time for a bit more Q&A later. Um, but what we're going to pass to now is the quick fire talks that I mentioned earlier. So insights from Irish projects that are applying um, nature related data. Um, and our first speaker is Lisa Coleman of the In Case project. Um, so Lisa, if you want to share your screen there. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so hi everyone, I'm the GIS analyst working on the InCase project and InCase is an EPA funded project piloting the application of natural capital accounting principles at a catchment scale in Ireland. And it's an interdisciplinary project with ecologists, economists, geographers and natural capital experts in Ireland. Um, as well as UN system of environmental economic accounting experts in Australia. I won't have time to talk you through all we have, but please visit the InCase website where you can find more information and resources. So this is the CIA accountant model, which underpins the InCase thinking and provides a framework for data gathering and aligning the accounting conversation. So up until now, there'd been no organized or coherent approach to natural capital accounting in Ireland. And in case is about mapping out the process steps to develop natural capital accounting at a range of scales. So the project is looking at four catchments. So we have the Cara catchment in Kerry, the Bride catchment in East Cork, the Dargo catchment, which is in South Dublin and North Wicklow, and then the Fidgel catchment, which is in Offaly and Kildare. And these are current land cover maps and looking at them, you can see how varied the land cover is in the catchments. With the bride dominated by agriculture, the Cara and Fidgel having significant areas of wetlands. And then the Dargal, which is a mix of wetlands, agriculture, forestry and urban areas. So for the project, we've been in contact with or use data from a variety of agencies, some of which I've listed here to give you an idea of the diversity of data required for the project. And I just want to take the time now just to thank all agencies we've been in contact with and who've provided us with data. We really appreciate the time and effort people have put into helping us. Um, but as you can probably imagine when using data from so many agencies, there's many challenges that come along with them um, combining and are looking at the data sets holistically. So firstly, actually gathering and finding the data has been a challenge. So portals like data.gov.ie have a lot of information but the majority of data sets we used actually involved going directly to the data provider themselves, even if the data was open source. And this was often because we couldn't actually find the data set online or we needed clarification on shorthand codes in the data set or other metadata issues. And it highlights the need for all data and metadata required for natural capital accounting to be available in one location. The next challenge is the coverage of spatial data. So some of the data sets are available only for part of a catchment or one of four catchments, while others are available nationally. So for in case that can make it difficult to actually compare some aspects or ecosystems between the catchments because we've better data for some than for others. For spatial data with so many agencies involved, there's several different coordinate systems used, different resolutions and different minimum mapping units. And this often means that more work than necessary is required to match up or compare data sets. Next is that there's often different time series used for agencies' data collection. So there, case, Lisa. Some, thanks. Um, so um, some data sets we use were collected every year, others were every three years, and then others were every five years. And this means that working on natural capital accounting for a specific year can be quite challenging. Next were data gaps. And we found that the majority of data gaps so far in the project were in terms of condition where very little data was collected and often when data was available for condition it was only released aggregated to a national level and um, as well as this there was no ecosystem map of ireland and the osi land cover map is yet to be released but this should fill in a lot of the gaps we've encountered 
working at a catchment level itself has also proven to be difficult. And this is because very few agencies report or collect data at a catchment level. So getting data sets to match up is difficult because anything reported at ED or county level uh, doesn't match our catchment boundaries. And um, <coughs> sorry, this has been particularly evident when we've moved on to services where figures for population, uh, water provision or livestock are reported at ED, small area or townland level. Um, but I just want to say that while challenges uh, with data are, are evident, it doesn't mean that natural capital accounting can't be done. And the in-case project has proven that with work we've done so far. Um, just to finish up with an example of how we actually use data. So on the left is a map of Corrie in 2018 forestry and woodland um, in the Dargal. And um, <laughs> sorry, what Corrie tells us is that about 18% of the catchment is covered in trees. But when comparing Corrie alone, for extent, to when we add in other data sets like the Native Woodland Scheme or Quilch of Lots, the map on the right better represents the picture we get a tree cover in the catchment. So instead of 18%, these data sets combined tell us that about 40% of the catchment is covered in trees. And this just uh, highlights the importance of collecting as many relevant data sets as possible and having them available for use. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Super, thanks a million, Lisa. Um, really, really interesting. Uh, we'll move on quickly to Luke Binns, um, who's going to talk to us about Dublinked, which is the open data platform for Dublin. Looks good, Luke. Thanks. Oh, uh, you're just on mute there, Luke. Thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> Dublin, yes, it, it is indeed the open data platform for the Dublin region, and it's run by Smart Dublin. And Smart Dublin is an initiative of the four Dublin local authorities. It's uh, not sorry. So an initiative of the four Dublin local authorities that works with um, technology providers, large as small researchers, citizens to um, improve local authority services and address city region challenges. These challenges um, might be congestion, they might be emissions and uh, air quality, and they might be flooding. There's uh, over a hundred projects which are in train across the, the, the county, the city and region um, addressing all these issues. So we're very outward facing. We have a collaboration model. We work with uh, tech companies, large and small research centers, um, civil society, and uh, other state bodies such as national agencies, local ones. So we say that we are uh, challenge based. Um, we have a collaboration model and we're data driven. And one of our data initiatives is indeed the regional open data portal known as Dublinked, which might be accessed at data.smartdublin.ie. And there we publish data uh, from primarily from the four Dublin local authorities. We have about 300 data sets up there and some from our external parties as well, such as uh, the NTA or the EPA and so forth. Uh, here's an example of our Map Explorer that we also have on the platform, and it's showing the accessible parking bays in Fingal County Council, in the County Council area. So everything we publish is also cascaded upwards to the national and onto the European open data portals. And in terms of uh, nature and environmental data, well, local authorities have a role in waste management and circular economy, noise, air quality, energy use, water quality, flooding, uh, parks, biodiversity and tree surveys. And we will publish some of that data, although by no means not as much as we'd like to on all of those areas. And that's just a, a highlight there of a project called um, Operandum, which is about nature-based solutions and it's using flooding data published on our portal. So other users are, include the Dublin dashboard, which uh, takes data from Dublin and many other sources to show how Dublin is doing. And here the illustration shows how um, air travel fell off a cliff with the onset of COVID last year. Another user would be um, this Access Earth uh, application, which takes the accessible parking and lots of other data sets and accessibility and uh, for use and reuse by the, um, uh, their user team. We publish uh, bike share data for Dublin bikes, uh, Moby bikes, and um, Leaper bikes. So if you want to know where your nearest bike share is, you don't need to go to each of those apps to originally check them all. You can go straight to the Dublin Cycle Party app 
and the field are on there and find out what you're looking for. We're involved in various projects, including this project here, Hale and Hearty, which is to create an online health and well-being open data knowledge base and an app as well to um, encourage uh, healthier and more well-being oriented uh, lifestyles and activities. We have a challenge running at the moment. It's this um, open data active travel challenge, which uses um, open data around transportation to support and promote um, active travel, walking and cycling. Um, parking maps, uh, routes, um, heat maps and analysis, citizen science and engagement, and even reward and gamification. So this is all in train and should be um, uh, uh, finishing up with a, a, an end event at the end of next month. If anyone's One minute it. there, Luke. Oh, thank you. So in terms of challenges, one of our primary challenges are uh, really articulating the value of uh, open data to our colleagues within local authorities and getting them to prepare and um, uh, release their data as open data. It can be seen as difficult, as time consuming, as a potentially risky activity that shows up um, um, potentially issues with the quality of the data or other issues around uh, what we're doing within the local authorities. And there's also, I suppose, the, the, the response that um, why would you publish it in any way? Who is interested in it? So I suppose we try to turn it around using uh, national policy and uh, the EU uh, legislation, uh, which is to be transposed this summer, the Open Data Directive recast. Uh, to say that we should really be publishing data insofar as possible by default. So the question shouldn't be, why should I publish, but rather, why shouldn't I publish? Uh, publicly, publishing should be the default option. And why? Well, it brings around um, opportunities for more efficient and effective services, innovation and economic development, all those applications I just mentioned, to improve the quality, the act of preparing the data for publication and getting the feedback once it's published does improve the quality and it helps with promoting collaboration both with external parties and even internally because um, local authorities like many other organizations can be quite siloed and it helps with the communication knowledge between all the different sectors. And of course it helps with our objectives and commitments with regards to transparency. And so uh, that was a whistle stops tour. If you'd like any more information, do please uh, come to data at smartdublin.ie, uh, uh, the Open Data Portal, or even Smart Dublin's own website. Uh, we have a public facing Trello board. It has a lot more information on some of our key projects there. Uh, thanks for having us. That's my contact details there if anyone would like to reach out to me as well. Pleasure. Excellent. Thanks, Luke. Um, great to see kind of a regional um, uh, open data platform, which I imagine provides more granularity that Lisa had been uh, talking about before. Um, so we'll pass on to Ainoa Gonzalez now, um, who's going to speak about the um, environmental sensitivity mapping, mapping tool. We did have um, the operandum project on the agenda, but due to a COVID case, um, they, they couldn't make it. But uh, Luke mentioned it, and uh, we'd encourage you to check out the operandum project on nature-based solutions as well. So over to Ainoa. Thank you, Orla. Just going to share that. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. Very quick tour of the environmental sensitivity mapping web tool that I should mention is funded by the Environmental Protection Agency and published in Ireland Survey's GeoHive and data platform. And we also got support now from the Office of the Planning Regulator. So it's been embraced by a number of governmental authorities and is widely used by local authorities and consultancies to support a strategic environmental assessment. Um, to provide a bit of context for those of you that have not heard of a strategic environmental assessment before, is a European requirement to undertake, to anticipate the potential impact, I suppose, of planning decisions and to integrate environmental considerations into such decisions. So as you can imagine, to do that, you need to bring a lot of uh, environmental um, aspects together and what the ESM does is bring all those to a centralized platform, to a single platform where everyone can just access environmental data across the SEA themes, which are established by law, and uh, combine them in a way to identify the different vulnerabilities of lands to different development types. So in this context, I just want to highlight as well that a lot of the presentations so far, and I suppose the sessions this morning as well, have been focusing on local data. and I. You know, I, I recognize that a lot of the work is carried out at the local level with specific surveys, but we need to also keep in mind that bringing all this together in a meaningful way that has proper geographical coverage and at the right scale is necessary to inform strategic decisions. And this is what the ESM aims to do. So it's bringing all national data sets together with national 
coverage, geographical coverage at available scales, unfortunately, and bringing them together to inform decisions at that level and to anticipate problems and avoid land use conflicts when it comes down to project implementation. Um, the ESM builds on the GISA manual, which is kind of integrated environmental, sorry, integrated special considerations into environmental assessments and planning decisions, and it's been applied to many uh, local authority county development plans, but also a more national level with the likes of the air grid um, network planning. The ESM itself is composed of two main parts, and I don't have the time to actually demonstrate it to you, but um, if you have the time or you have any questions after the session and you want a quick demo, I'll be happy to, to do so. But to give you a quick overview, what we've done is centralize all um, data sets accord and group them according to SEA themes. So you can see their air and climatic factors, biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. And each, sorry, I'm just quickly going through here as well, that this is kind of the breadth of data sets that we have included in the ESM tool. We started with 60, we're over 130 now, and we continue to grow because we think the more information is readily, be, readily available there for users into a centralized server, and the more the less hassle and the more informed decision making. So what I wanted to say here as well is that for each of the data sets, we've built metadata. So we collect in or we identify where we source the information from, when was last updated and when we included it into the tool. But we also provide in a description of what that data set is about. We think this is really important because it helps increase the environmental awareness of those using the tool, because often local authority planners won't have a clue what, you know, a uh, Margaret area sensitive area is or what Annex 1 habitats mean. So by having that descriptor of the data set, we're hoping that they also become more aware of these um, considerations uh, and bring them into their planning processes. Um, when clicking on layers, we're picking up of all the layers that are capture at that particular location. So in the screenshot here, you can see one of five. So there is, in this particular case, five um, natural assets of five sensitivities overlapping at that location. So again, you can bring it down to site level if you wanted to, if the data is available. And- One minute, Anua. Thank you. <laughs> You're, the, I suppose, novelty of the tool is that it's got a widget that produces sensitivity maps. So you can select what layers you bring into the analysis, you combine them together and you create what they call environmental sensitivity maps. And just to give you a feel here, you have a breadth of four different types of maps, depending on the criteria you bring into the analysis and the weight that you might apply to those criteria, because you might want to emphasize the relevance of a given criteria, you'll derive different sensitivity maps. So this allows planners, again, to explore different scenarios of protection or bringing in public concerns into the analysis and see how different criteria might affect the overall vulnerability of the various lands. So just to finish up, it's just been, um, there have been, a number of people have called it the game changer and that is just bringing in environment now to the center of planning and decision making by bringing all the data, by simply centralizing all the data and by making sure that there is no need for GIS technical skills to access that data is really changing the way planning is done in Ireland. Uh, in the context of this workshop, I just wanted to highlight that we still have a number of limitations. There is data gaps, obviously, habitat mapping being one of them, landscape characterization being a massive one, depending for what sector. There's also issues in terms of scale, granularity and comprehensiveness of certain data sets, natu national coverage. And then uh, it was mentioned in the previous presentation, but it's a very big issue, the lack of, the lack of consistency across data sets that are being gathered by different projects, but also by different local authorities, because it makes the data very difficult to actually amalgamate and bring together in a pl platform such as this one. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Excellent. Thanks, Anoa. Um, yeah, really, really interesting to see that tool and delighted to hear that it's um, transforming how planning is done so that, uh, you know, environmental considerations are just the, the default. Um, okay, so our final flash speaker um, are Tim McCarthy and Rowan Feely from the Terrain AI project. Um, so I'll pass over to, to you guys if you want to share your screen or uh, whichever way you want to do it. Thanks, guys. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks, Orla. We're just coming on board here and um, 
just uh, uh, trying to get, get it up and running. What we'll do here is, if it's okay, I think Rowan will start and uh, we'll hand over to me after a few slides, if that's okay. Across to you, Thanks, Rowan. Steve. Yeah, you, you click through for me. So uh, as Tim has indicated, I'm just going to do a very brief run through some context and then hand over to Tim for the platform. So look, Terrain AI started on the 1st of January this year. It's a new kid on the block. And I, I suppose our core aim here is to look at improving our understanding of the interactions uh, between natural and human activities, uh, specifically focused on uh, uh, carbon. Uh, it's comprised of uh, a partnership of six uh, research uh, institutes uh, and includes Microsoft. Microsoft are funding this because it tightly aligns with their sustainability initiative, but we also have a number of government departments. We saw MPWS and EPA already present uh, at today's session. Uh, European agencies were also reaching out to uh, industry and uh, community groups. Uh, I suppose at the heart of what we're trying to do here is effectively pull together the petabyte uh, scale volume uh, of data sets uh, and using novel kind of computational workflows add value to these data sets that they can then be implied to inform a state of the art earth system model based approaches, ultimately to understand the geography of carbon emissions uh, across the landscape. Uh, this is kind of the key, uh, next slide T, key schematic uh, for uh, terrain AI. And, and ultimately we're looking at to develop, construct and apply uh, a carbon emissions decision support system focused on uh, a range of uh, land uh, cover types as illustrated here. Uh, it's really centered around the digital data platform, which Tim will talk about, which uh, incorporates up to 21 kind of representative benchmark sites, uh, but also includes regional, national and global data, uh, global data sets and data repositories uh, of relevance. Here we have uh, an indication of some of the, Tim, if you can just go back two slides very quickly. Uh, we'll go just a very brief overview of the, the benchmark sites here and their locations. They're mainly agricultural and land use, but represent a range of different uh, land covers with a range of instruments, all of which will be uh, fed into the data platform. T Hey, Joanna. Okay, uh, I'll just jump in. So uh, very quickly, um, we've got a couple of work packages there. And um, uh, these deal with, um, I guess, revolve around the data platform, which is, I guess, is the, the, the main focus for today's kind of, kind of workshop. So uh, if we just take a look at that, again, this is a pretty boring slide. Be pretty, um, uh, most of the people here will be pretty au fait with this, but uh, data layers down at the bottom, working up into uh, layer two applications, three development, and you'll see the, those classic kind of uh, data handling um, uh, modules uh, from ingestion right through to uh, simulation there and of course the usual cloud uh, bits there underpinning that data catalog at the heart of this uh, 120 odd different data sets last speaker uh, mentioned the importance of metadata data and indeed the, the speaker before and this is quite key here to making sure we can build up that you know stack from you know underpinning geology right up to atmosphere and indeed the more eclectic data sets from human activity data privacy of course at the fore and standards we should keep an eye on as well data cube is something that we should uh, we're introducing at the minute building that out for this because it is petabyte scale key things here is how this can be used in terms of just not just storage and discovery but also the uh, higher end analysis and um, modeling plays a key Key role here. The third component, I guess, is the uh, dashboard. And again, the last speaker, you know, uh, showed a couple of um, uh, bits on on that. And um, uh, like that's quite key in terms of visualization. Quick commercial break, just looking at some of the data sets we deal with: full stack, satellite, down to airborne, down to in situ, hyperspectral, multimodal across into lidar, and uh, full range. Uh, do you want to say something about the? Field instruments there, Ron. One, yeah, one minute I, there left. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Grant. Yeah. Yeah, I look at part of what we're trying to consolidate here is kind of the national landscape in terms of infrastructure, including, for example, uh, the Daffin Fund at Chagas National Carbon Observatory, plus existing uh, flux tower infrastructure, along with infrastructure that we were, we're deploying as part of uh, Terrain AI. And that's really to kind of be able to forensically understand and analyze and measure uh, the various land cover types. Okay, so like uh, more or less finished, uh, looking at uh, again some of the drone bits we're in introducing over the coming weeks, uh, GPR soil uh, categorization and looking at how we can use new technologies to understand that. Sniffers, of course, uh, with drones uh, across SOX, NOx, CO2, PM and so on, bringing those uh, on board. And then those uh, kind of funny ones dealing with human activity, always a hard one because you're, you're trying to kind of get at behaviours and also watch where you go with GDPR and uh, the, the ethical side. 
Finishing up at this slide, well, sorry, before I do that, machine learning, of course, we've got another workflow in trying to help us understand what's going on on the ground. And finishing up at this slide, really data platform at the heart, those uh, components of the data platform all around, catalog, cube, dashboard, and then pushing up into those information um, services. Siorla, I think that's enough from us, I think, at this point. Oh, that's super. Yeah, really whistle stop tour of uh, terrain AI. But um, I know you guys presented at the uh, Open Data for Climate um, event last week, which I'd encourage people to go back to. Uh, the the slides and presentations are available on Derelinks um, page. Really, really interesting parallel conversation. But I think your project, you know, has uh, the climate data that can obviously uh, have multiple benefits for nature. Um, so just to just to kind of give you a status update, we uh, have one more, um, I, I got it wrong, so we, we have one more um, quick fire speaker, then we're going to move over to the rapporteur and finish up at about uh, 15.40, uh, so just a little bit later than uh, previously advertised, but there will be a chance for, for you guys to have a bit more discussion. Um, so once we finish up with our, uh, with Kevin, not last but not least with the Demeter project. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Orla. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Doolan. And I'm Director of Innovation in the Walton Institute, which is formerly the TSSG. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the Demeter project. Uh, Demeter is the Greek goddess of agriculture, in case anyone's wondering what, where the name came from. Um, I suppose to discuss the use of data, um, particularly in the ag tech sector, first of all, we need to look at some of the, the various challenges that we're there, that we have there in terms of sectoral and policy requirements that exist today. Um, Modernization of the common agricultural policy is a very critical element. So with its focus on, for example, rebalancing power in the food chain, supporting generation renewal, uh, ensuring fair income and protection of food and health quality. Uh, and a lot of these challenges can be addressed through digitalization. Um, but there are a number of bottlenecks uh, that need to be overcome and which we're addressing uh, within this project. Uh, and these are things like the lack of infrastructure, connectivity and broadband, so you can bring cutting edge data and technology closer to the field. Uh, limited awareness on behalf of farmers about the benefits um, that technology can bring to them. Uh, so it's not just enough to assume that if we build some technological system, they'll come. Uh, farmer skills also need to be updated um, in certain cases so they can exchange in more meaningful and productive ways with data and uh, technology. Uh, on the technical side, um, interoperability between systems is, is still relatively limited. Um, and this is often true with defined or a lack of defined standards and um, wild garden business models. Uh, also, ownership of data itself is quite critical, and particularly when you think about the, the future common agricultural policy, where we're trying to rebalance power. How can we do it if, if farmers, for example, can't retain their data ownership? Uh, beyond these limiting factors, there's also a, a number of risks. Um, so for example, the digital divide, um, potentially between small farmers and large multi-farm players, it can really increase if equal access to technology isn't provided. And we also need to look at the impact on jobs. So if we automate more, potentially we need humans less uh, in the field. And then to add to this mix of, of sectoral kind of challenges, we have obviously the, the Green Deal, um, but this can also be seen as a, an opportunity. So increased technology deployment and increased support of intelligence based on data can make great inroads towards sustainability, um, but not without considering some of these challenges that I've just mentioned. Uh, so what's Demeter? Um, we're a large scale project of 60 partners across 18 countries uh, funded under Horizon 2020. Uh, our core goal in the project is to implement interoperability across the agri chain, essentially from farm to fork. Uh, but particularly at a data level. Um, to verify the results of the project, we have about 20 pilots planned uh, and started actually across five major sectors, and these are, these are already underway. Um, we also plan significant dissemination of our results, uh, which we hope will result in increased uptake, and this is particularly through uh, one of the partners, that's the World Farmers Organization. So you can see on the map here uh, the spread of our pilots across Europe. Uh, to verify these systems that we're putting in place, um, as I've already mentioned, we've got a series of 20 data-driven pilots that are organized into five broad categories, uh, as you can see on the slide. And on our website, actually, there's, there's case studies for all of these in, in a lot more detail. But just for example, um, 
We have underwater and energy management related to arable crops. We have things like smart energy management in irrigated crops and optimal rice irrigation. Um, also related to arable crops and under precision farming, we've got in-service agricultural machinery condition monitoring. Uh, we've got data brokerage and decision support system development as well. Just one minute there. Um, for crop health and uh, quality, we're focusing around the fruit and vegetable sector. And just for example, there we're building decision support systems uh, and dashboards for olive growers. Um, in the livestock sector, we're looking at things like animal health, for example, and we have a dairy farmers dashboard for the milk and the meat uh, production chains. And then we have a number of cross-sectoral uh, pilots as well. Uh, so for example, there we're looking at pollination optimization in apiculture or enabling transparency in the poultry industry supply chain. So you can see quite a broad range of, of pilots. And, and the reason for that broad range is to ensure that the technological solutions and data integrations that we produce in the project are relevant uh, across the board and be, can, be, can be deployed in as diverse settings as we can find. Uh, very briefly, uh, here are some of the challenges uh, and recommendations um, to do with, with managing data in, in projects like this. I mean, first of all, and I know it's been mentioned before, we have to adhere to the, the FAIR principles for data. So it has to be findable, accessible, interoperable, uh, and reliable and reusable, I should say. Um, we also like to implement um, uh, benchmarking for, for quality and comparison. So taking data from one site, taking a similar data set from another site and then benchmarking and looking at the best practice across those. Uh, data semantics is a, is a, a significant um, challenge as well um, for any project dealing with data coming from multiple different sensors, multiple different sources. <clears throat> so just understanding what that data represents can be quite challenging. Um, excuse me, and I've mentioned already data ownership. Um, we found that it's really important that we can demonstrate to, to users who's going to own that data and what rights they have and what rights other people have to their data uh, in the agricultural context. Um, briefly, in terms of recommendations uh, for systems such as this, it's critical to engage all stakeholders. Um, so within Demeter, we have a, a multi-actor approach from the outset of the project. I should say it's a 42-month project. Uh, and we're at month 18 at the moment, but we've required, we've managed requirements on data management for partners all the way through the project since the, the day one. Uh, it's critical as well to demonstrate the value um, that we can get from integrating these different data sets. Uh, and we have found through, through surveying people that, that individuals don't mind giving up their data as long as they can actually see what value is going to be given back to them as a result. Uh, data openness, of course, is, is really important and, and being able to give data back to uh, the community, to open data sets and so on. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is, is don't reinvent the wheel. We, we see lots of different projects emerging with new software architectures and so on for management of data. But there's a huge amount of projects already built that do this maybe in different contexts, like smart cities, for example. Um, so as much as possible, try and leverage what already exists uh, in existing projects. Uh, this is just a quick slide to show if you want to get more information about the project or look at our Twitter, uh, our Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Um, also, if, if people want to get involved, um, we have a, a cascade fund within the project, which means we can give out money to other organizations um, to come and try some of our use cases in different contexts or, or introduce new technologies uh, into the project as well. So if you keep an eye on our website, you can see when those funding opportunities come up or else uh, just drop me an email uh, and I can I can explain that to people. That's me uh, in under the five minutes and that's my contact details if anybody wants more information. Great, thanks William and Kevin. Um, so we will do a few um, a few minutes of questions and answers just because we've heard a lot, um, a lot of different projects and I think people are keen to know more. Uh, so I'll pass over to Esel to field those um, and then we'll come back take a breather just uh, and ha have that uh, rapporteur session with uh, with Kieran. Thanks so much. Um, so our first question is for um, Ainoa. Um, Catherine is just wondering how the ESM tool is maintained to keep it current uh, in terms of things like Article 17 data, site surveys, things like that. Um, thank you, Catherine, for raising that question. We. Um, we have a maintenance agreement whereby we review all data sets every quarter of the year. So every three months, we 
undertake a thorough review and update any data sets and include new data sets as well. So it's manual. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and then the next question for Kevin um, from Jane, can you tell us a bit more about the Demeter pilot on pollination, crop pollination services or supporting wild pollinators for wider ecosystems? So what, what way is it working? I think you're on mute there. Yeah, sorry, I'm muted. Uh, yeah, what I can do is I, I'll paste in a link here into the chat where you can get full details of that um, particular case study. Uh, it's about integrating fire management systems and APRE management systems, which are various advisory and decision support services built on top of them. But I'll give you the link. I'll just put it in here. That's great. Thank you very much. Back over to you, Orla. Great. Thanks, Mayan. Um, all right, so I'll hand over to uh, Kieran, um, who is from the Agri Discrete project um, and is going to act as uh, our rapporteur and kind of high level, give us a high level overview of everything we've heard today, uh, if that's possible. But uh, yeah, over to you, Kieran, for some reflections. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, Orla, yeah, I, I think it's, it's probably impossible. Um, I'll set the bar low. I, I think it's impossible to try and capture everything um, we've discussed the, this morning. but. We'll give it a go in, in a minute, but maybe to, to start with, I'll, I'll just talk for a couple of minutes about the Agri Discrete project, which is, is slightly different from the projects we've, we've heard from already in that we're, we're not looking at a, a specific challenge or a specific issue in the, the data for nature or data for agri uh, domain. We're taking a broader approach and looking at data use and data possibilities within the, the agri and the, the forestry sectors. Um, so what I might do is, is just by way of, uh, if I can share it there. Um, if I can't, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, I don't know if that's, that's gonna pop up there. It would have been an example of one of our recent deliverables where we were looking at how and why um, the, the business reasons or the operational reasons behind data, uh, data use in the, the agri sector. Um, I, I can share that with you later anyway, but it was just by way of, of the type of deliverable um, that we're producing at the moment. Um, so I guess the, the project is looking at, as I said, data use, it's a two year project and it's funded by the, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Um, and it's built around, it starts with, and it, it, it begins and ends with a, a multi-actor approach. So we're talking to everybody, and maybe that's the first thing to say about data use in 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 any sector. You you and it's it's this is one thing that's been highlighted throughout the day as well. You you've got to involve, or you've got to engage all stakeholders. Um, and in our multi-actor approach, we're we're talking to everybody. I, I think we're having six, maybe seven different workshops. We've we've had two, um, we've we've four or five more to go. Um, so we're talking to everybody from policymakers to, to technical and data companies who, who supply services based on gathering data um, from farmers and, and from, from, from others as well. We're talking to the, the farmers themselves um, and we've got environmental NGOs uh, on our list as well. So I'll, I'll have one request for, for anybody who's in that category um, at the end of this talk. And... Our multi-actor approach is, is, is looking at things from, from three specific aspects. Um, we're looking at things from the technical point of view, which I think we've, we've covered quite a lot um, during the talks this morning and this afternoon. And we looked at data formats and data structures, where data is stored, how it's made accessible, how it's made discoverable, um, if it's sensitive data, is the, the security and the access to it matched to how sensitive um, it is? So, so that's one aspect, the technical aspect. We're also looking at it from the, the business or the, the operational uh, aspect as well. So we're, we're calling it business modeling, but it's more so about the, the, the operational and the, the day to day uh, questions of, of well, why do organizations gather data in this sector in, in the first place? Um, what did they do with it? Do they monetize it? Um, what type of value do they give back to the people that they're gathering the data from? Um, and again, we're, we're asking questions, I suppose, on, on the broader sense of, of why might they share that data and why might they not share that data? Um, so that's the second aspect, um, the business or the operational side of things. 
And then the, the third aspect um, we're looking at it from is, is, is just in terms of social science and the ethics around the use of data itself. Um, who owns the data? Who is benefiting from the data? Is, is, is what's being done socially acceptable? Um, are there any unethical practices in terms of, of harvesting data and giving nothing in return? Um, it's, it's again, as we've seen here uh, during the day, it's, it's complex. You're, you're gathering data most of the time from a farm level, then it maybe goes to a, a technical company or a processor who might or might not share it with a, a government body. And then it may go to a, a European body as well. So that there's a lot of exchange potentially within that. Um, so from the social science point of view, we would just want to make sure that there's, there's you know, there's, there's a bit of fair play for everybody along the, the value chain. Um, as I said, it's, it's a two year project. Results are starting to, to, to emerge now um, around the, the, the motivations and the, the, in particular the, the, the incentives for data gathering and, and data use and who ultimately is a, a data consumer. Um, there's insights uh, coming from various actors as well. Um, and I'm smiling as I say that now because that's a very polite way of saying um, some of the workshops, we've, the temperature has been fairly high. Uh, between different um, data gatherers or data collectors. Um, so that, that's that been quite interesting and, and fairly insightful too. Um, there's, there's a lot of strong feelings around who should and who shouldn't um, gather data and who should and shouldn't monetize data and that side of things. And we've also arrived, I guess, at maybe some of the first policy recommendations. Um, and one aspect we're looking at, and uh, maybe it's something of relevance for the data we spoke about today as well is uh, what might a future data marketplace look like? Um, or is that one model that we, we can look at when it comes to data sharing? Um, if, if we create this, this idea of a marketplace or the parallels we were using in the, the agri space or to do with the, um, the marts that are dotted all around the country, um, where, where they, the functions that they provide and the services they provide in terms of somebody having something to sell and it being a, almost a brokerage center, um, could that repl be replicated in terms of data sets? That's, that's just one of the ways we're, we're looking at. Um, so that's, that's Agri Discreet. Um, and I, I, I guess the last message from us is that uh, the Agri Discreet project, I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody um, about anything we are seeing or anything you might like to share with us uh, in terms of data use related to nature, related to agriculture, forestry, absolutely anything in, in that sector. Um, so please send us your thoughts. Um, you can get my contact details from Orla. And the last thing then about Agri Discrete and data use there is that uh, we have four, if not five more workshops um, to take place in our multi-actor approach. So if you do get an email from me um, or from anybody else in the project, you, you might respond positively and say you're, you're happy to take part. Um, that would certainly be appreciated. So that's Agri Discreet. Um, that's the work we're doing there and the, the, the three-pronged approach we're taking towards um, data use in, in that sector. Um, so briefly then, I'll, I'll try and just run through um, to refresh people's minds as to what we covered today. Um, in the morning session, we, we started off with, with Ed Curry, Yvonne Buckley and Gemma, who, who painted the bigger picture for us. Um, and, and I guess based on Agri Discrete and the multi-actor approach and another aspect that, that really piqued my interest this morning um, was the imagery and the analogs used by, by Ed who compared data um, to it being the new oil or gold mining and the ecosystems and how they build up naturally in, in any area. Um, and I guess it got me thinking to, to communication and the fact that understanding um, really is key and like, even for those of us who, who work on data and in work on data in the nature and in the agri space, like data is still a relatively new and a nebulous type of concept. So when we're talking, I think to each other in particular, when we have all got different backgrounds and, and what's data to me is different to data to you and what's accessibility to you is, is, is more about availability to me. I think if we can create analogs to what we already understand, um, then we're heading in the right direction. And I think a second aspect of that is when we're gathering data and citizen science was mentioned a couple of times too, um, we're, we're gonna to be talking to people who don't work 
on data and it's not their job to be data experts. So again, if, if we can use good analogs and good imagery to help with that communication, I, I think that's, that's key and that's important too. Um, and again, I suppose the, one of the other points that popped up was the, around the idea of, of motivation and the incentives for citizen science. And if, if we can get that right again, then we're off to a good start. Then we can, we can start to worry about the, the, the next level up uh, and whether data is accurate and, and the format it's in and how we make it discoverable and all that side of things. But if we start with the, the data collectors, whoever they are, then we've, we've got a good chance. Um, similarly and, and related to that, I think as well, um, are concrete examples. Like we're, we're, I suppose just by nature, we're inclined to talk about things in an abstract type way, um, given the, the research and the academic and the public sector world that a lot of us on the, the, the workshop are in. So I think real world examples, as we saw in the afternoon um, from the various projects, I, I think can be really, really useful um, as well. So I guess the, the, the thought on the, the breakout session, um, and I'm not going to go into any details here on it, but we, we, we looked at accessibility, at availability, usability, discoverability, like there's, there's a lot of abilities thrown in there. And that's, that's a lot of requirements that we're asking of, of data collectors and data processors. So I think, again, what we're getting to hear, um, and it's one of the things that, that struck me there, I'm just going to highlight it in a second, is that data, data gathering and, and data processing is complex. And we, we, we need to just bear that in mind, I guess, when we do come across various issues and various challenges. Um, and then, as I said, we, we, we got some real, real world examples from that um, with the specific examples uh, we had in the afternoon. And lastly then, I, I guess, and I'll, I'll throw the floor open to, to everybody on the call then and hand the, the reins back to, to Orla. Um, just a couple of thoughts that, that struck me. And again, this is by no way a summary, it's, it's more to, to provoke discussion or, or debate or, or to perhaps even to raise the temperature a little bit. Um, but just the, the last few points um, to, is to say, like, we're, we're dealing with nature and that's complex. And the data sets that reflect that need to be complex, too, if they're going to reflect or, or try to digitally capture what's uncapturable. Uh, and that will be our new word for today. Um, so this makes things hard, but it doesn't make it impossible to use standards and to have common formats and to make sure the documentation around data is, is as useful to others as, as it is for ourselves. Um, one of the things that struck me was the, the, the ability to augment and to add to existing data sets, be that with new variables or additional instances or, or just to update anything is, is really important, I think, to, to keep them updated um, because look, I don't need to tell anybody, nature changes on a daily, weekly, monthly, hourly basis. So we need to keep those data sets as real and as close to, to nature as is possible. Um, I'm not gonna get into the next point I've written down here. I think we've covered that already. Communication is key between us as, as data collectors and as data users and from the, the citizen science approach when the, the data collectors are, are non-experts. And I don't mean that in, in a bad way for a split second. Um, and again, I think that that relates, that brings us back to the idea of stakeholder engagement. Um, the clearer we can be around communication, the better the engagement, the better we all are then. Um, the last thing um, I'm going to do is insult everybody and say data ultimately is, is only a means to an end. Like every one of us working on a project, um, especially the ones highlighted this afternoon, like we're, we're using data. It's a means to an end. We, we use it to solve issues and to an, advance opportunities in, in different domains and different areas. So I guess we shouldn't lose sight of that either. Like it's, 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 it's not, it is up to a point, all about the data, but it's only a means to an end. And, and then we go back to what we really try to fix, whether that's water quality or, or anything else uh, along the way. Um, so that's it. I, I'm going to leave you with that insult and um, open up the floor for ideas or for further questions. If anybody, I guess, has, has best practice stories on a problem that was solved in a particular domain or you think there's something that, that hasn't been covered or, or something that should be covered that warrants another workshop or another discussion, 
Um, I'm sure Orla will will pick up the thread there as well. So um, that's as much that's uh, as many as the bullet points as as I've written down. So Orla, I'll I'll pass back to you then. If Super. That's okay. Yeah, thanks so much, Kieran. I think that was really, really useful to take that uh, bird's eye view of the day. Um, and certainly I've got a lot of notes um, from what you said for, for these uh, recommendations. Um, I just see a question in chat if anyone else has any questions or comments just before we close. Um, so question for Kieran, do you have any thoughts on the open litter map and on litter coin and the application of this approach to other citizen science projects? I don't know if you, if you know about that, Kieran. Um, I'm not aware of those specific instances, but um, I, I just guess on, on citizen science itself, um, I, I've been an evaluator for the European Commission on, on citizen science projects for, for a couple of years now. So when, when you're writing to the Commission looking for money in a proposal, um, I'm one of the ones telling you that something isn't done to a satisfactory level or anything like that. So it's, um, it's complex. And I think it, it, it in some senses or in every sense, the, the approach to citizen science has to be matched to the, the size of the issue. So if it's needed at a local level, keep it at a local level. If it needs to be a regional or a national level, that has to be factored in as well. And the citizen science approach will work in some instances, but it really has to be matched to the size of the project and the region if need be. And those things have to be factored in. And there's certainly not a one size fits all. So I can comment specifically on the open litter map or litter coin, but I think the citizen science is a really powerful means to gather data and to not just to gather it, but to send back out the results of a project um, as well. I, I, yeah. I can't really say any more about it. It gets that engagement in from the public as well, which we've talked about kind of getting non-expert uh, engagement yes. in there. Um, Brilliant. Uh, so just in the interest of time, I I'm going to close uh, the event here, um, but hopefully this is just the beginning of a uh, conversation. Uh, I've said it enough times that we're preparing these recommendations and, um, and we do value your input. But I want to say a huge thank you to all our speakers, the rapporteurs, the note takers and the attendees for all the work you put in the weeks leading up to this and today. Um, we're delighted with how it's gone. We're delighted with the participation and um, yeah, just please keep in touch with the, with the rest of this project. Um, thanks so much everyone and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks everyone. All right. Sorry. Thanks, Orla. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.